and it's still blinking. We've got the blinky, blinky, blinky. And there's the green one. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ben Williams, KK4EWT. Yeah, I'm a ham radio operator. I'm an extra class. That means that I've got, uh, I've taken all the tests I need to take. And I did that in a six month period. Uh, a lot of people know me from the Fedora project. Hello, okay. Hello, okay. I moved and I couldn't hear myself. Uh, 2011, I got my technician. I ran a 200-person conference for Fedora that January. That February, I was a general. That March, I was a extra. That April, I was an ARRLVE. According to the ARRL, I've got over 128 sessions that I've done in the last 10 years. And the last four years, I've done exclusively Loyal Amateur Radio Club testing because they are free. All right, the title of this talk is The History of Amateur Radio. Guess what? The ARL has already done the majority of the work for me. Yes, it's going to be a commercial for them. I'm sorry, but the info information is good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY. I'm standing in front of W1AW, the flagship operating station at the American Radio Relay League in Newington, Connecticut. Over the next half hour, we're going to take you on a journey through time, exploring the ARRL, its contributions to amateur or ham radio, and look at the technologies from Michael Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic induction in 1831 to high-speed multimedia networks in 2013. You'll get a look at where amateur radio and the ARRL have been and see the technology shaping our future. Stay right here. This is the ARRL. The ARRL's diamond logo is recognized and copied by radio hams all over the world. But what has made it so successful for 100 years? It's simple. The ARRL is people. I compete in amateur radio contests with other ham radio operators from around the world. I'm Valerie Hotzfeld, NV9L, and I am the ARRL. Armando Landrian, KB1, PRP. I enjoy field day, and I am the ARRL. I like doing per public service events and working with people in my community, and I'm the ARRL. I am the ARRL. Ham radio people with an enthusiasm and passion to learn, to do, and to create. Our mission is to promote and advance the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. ARRL not only reflects the commitment and enthusiasm of American hams, but also provides leadership as the voice of amateur radio in the USA, whether in dealings with the Federal Communications Commission, the World Radio Communication Conference, the International Amateur Radio Union, or with the general public. The ARRL is the primary source of information about what is going on in the ham radio world. It provides a number of books and web pages covering a spectrum of topics and also provides news, support, and information for individuals and clubs along with special operating events and all sorts of continuing education classes and other benefits to members. Being a member of ARRL is important for hams. The ARRL is devoted entirely to amateur radio, all of amateur radio. In fact, there would be no amateur radio as we know it today were it not for the ARRL members. This is W1AW, the flagship amateur radio station of the ARRL. When visiting ARRL headquarters, station W1AW is always the first place our members want to see. Visitors here may operate the station during visitor hours using any of the three operating studios. The Hiram Percy Maxson Memorial Station is known the world over. 
ARRL is America's National Association for Radio Amateurs, and there are over 700,000 people around the country who enjoy using and experimenting with wireless amateur communications. They do it for fun, no one pays them. That's why they're called amateurs, like amateur sports athletes. The ARRL is the largest and most influential amateur radio organization in the world. ARRL has led the way in making amateur radio the exciting, hands-on, technical hobby it is today. Join me as we go on this journey through time. Experiments to communicate by radio started toward the end of the 1800s. No one person invented radio or radio waves. The universe has been bouncing around electromagnetic waves since time itself began. Much like notes played on a piano, these electromagnetic waves span many frequencies. Microwaves, and infrared. Visible light and x-rays. But way down here at the bottom end, these waves have some miraculous abilities that people only discovered around 1900 and ARRL members have been in the forefront of finding new and amazing uses ever since. Not only what we usually think of as a radio, but also today's smartphones, televisions, satellites, Wi-Fi, and all the things in today's wireless world. They're all radios, sending and receiving those low radio frequencies with nothing between them but air. However, in those early years, people believed only the lowest frequencies were of any real use. And while there were people like Marconi who worked on commercial opportunities, more and more amateurs got interested as well. But there was a major problem with range. To get any real distance, radio signals in these low frequencies needed a lot of power and huge antennas. Otherwise, to get a message to a distant place, you would need to relay it through several intermediate stations. And by 1914, a relay system is exactly what two ambitious hams created. Hiram Maxim and Clarence Tusca began the American Radio Relay League, ARRL. At this time, telephones were rare and telegrams were expensive and required a trip to the telegraph office. But some towns had amateur radio enthusiasts more than willing to demonstrate their hobby by sending personal messages called radiograms for free to other amateurs for delivery. And by 1917, ARRL's relay system reached all the way across the country. A large part of the ARRL's success comes from our responsiveness to our members. We empower each member to openly share ideas and new developments, adopting what works best in a free exchange of ideas and new technology. It's been this philosophy which has kept us strong for over a century, while other groups have come and gone. And to meet the amateur's need to freely share their ideas, news, and how-tos, Tusca began publishing the magazine QST in 1915. QST is the monthly membership journal of ARRL, each issue, print and digital, is your source for equipment reviews, technical tips, projects, and news. In addition to receiving QST by mail each month, ARRL members now have access to the digital edition of QST. QST provided a broad source of information, <coughs> but everyone, commercial users and amateurs alike, were still using just a narrow part of the lowest radio frequencies and bad behaviors began to creep in. Stronger stations jammed weak ones until no one could get a message through. But Hiram Maxim had a remedy for that. ARRL members were held to high standards of operating practices, and they still are. In fact, amateur radio is one of the few radio services that the FCC depends upon 
pretty much to regulate itself. Through the ARRL, hams have developed a tradition of on-the-air courtesy. Bad behavior is shunned, and anonymity is not tolerated. Amateurs are assigned call signs, such as W1AW, by the federal government and are proud to identify themselves. There are lots of David Sumners in the world, but there is only one K1ZZ. But the biggest threat to amateur radio came from World War I. In 1918, Josephus Daniels, Secretary of the Navy, ordered the total shutdown of all radio use as the Navy was taking over. While approximately 4,000 hams enlisted to help communications work, the Navy had total control of all wireless technology. This was supposed to be only for the duration of the war, but... In April 1919, the year after the war ended, Daniels refused to release the Navy's total monopoly over radio use. So the fight was on. Um, this was the first of many great challenges faced by the AWRL. Maxim and Tusca responded with the Blue Card Appeal, which was essentially a public relations campaign using their own money to send out a mass mailing to every ham radio operator in the country, getting them to write Congress with their objection. Daniels countered with a new bill in the Senate, permanently giving the Navy all control. Maxim struck back in the Congress with the introduction of a House joint resolution. Daniels came back again, declaring that people would be allowed to receive radio signals, but only the Navy can send anything. But Maxim and the Hams finally won out as Congress forced the Navy to give up their radio monopoly and the Hams went back on the air. Uh, in fact, both commercial and amateur radio use exploded. Amateurs soon discovered the real magic of radio waves. Using higher frequencies, the so-called short waves, their radio signals now could cross continents. And in 1923, John Reinerts and Fred Schnell made direct two-way contact from Connecticut with Leon Deloy in France. The age of wireless intercontinental communication was started by amateurs. As hams learned how to skip radio signals around the world and international radio communication grew, the International Amateur Radio Union was formed in Paris. ARRL helped hams share these discoveries and tricks by publishing the very first ARRL handbook in 1926. Since then, this annual publication has grown with the technology, being constantly updated to be acclaimed as the most comprehensive RF engineering reference in the world. The 1920s were an exciting time. Radio was the rage, and the ARRL held its first radio contests. The 1930s began even better. The early 1930s saw ARRL encouraging hams with lots of operating activities. There was the first ARRL sweepstakes. The first ARRL field day was held in 1933. Hams were involved in many notable rescue operations and emergency work. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service, ARES, was formed. The Yagi type directional antenna was developed and Armstrong defined the new type signals we call FM. And in 1937, ARRL created the DXCC award for hams, contacting 100 or more countries, our most popular award. In 1938, the ARRL built W1AW, our flagship radio station. At the end of the 30s, there were about 42,000 hams in the U.S., and the hobby was growing fast. But storm clouds gathered as World War II began. All international transmissions were banned in 1940. A shortage of radio tubes for military radios resulted in the government asking ARRL to help collect them from hams as donations. Over 25,000 amateur radio operators volunteered for military service. They helped develop radar systems, proximity fuses, code analysis, and served as communications specialists. Unlike World War I, at the end of the war years, hams were back on the air and even had new, very high frequencies to use. In the 1950s, 
thousands of people got the new amateur radio novice license. But the world changed in 1957. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. And that day arrived, October 4th, 1957. With the surprise launch of Russia's Sputnik in 1957, the space race began, and amateur radio operators were again in the thick of things. Americans began to drive to catch up, and major efforts were directed at getting citizens more involved in the sciences. While amateurs always sought more knowledge and skill, the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the space race, and nuclear fears created pressures for everyone to get more education in technology. Hams responded with Project Oscar, and in 1961 launched the first amateur radio satellite, Oscar-1. This is an exact copy of the original that went in space. By 1969, a whole organization, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, AMSAT, was formed. AMSAT designs, builds, arranges for, and operates satellite-carrying amateur radio payloads. The ARRL has continued to play a major role in space working with the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment, CEREX, which promoted the use of amateur radio by astronauts on the Space Shuttle with other amateur radio stations around the world. Today we have the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS, program. In the 1970s, the International Telecommunication Union, the world's overall coordinating body for radio and other frequency uses, decided to do a comprehensive survey of all radio communications frequencies. The phrase used was, from DC to daylight. Realizing this could change amateur radio, ARRL President Bob Denniston and staffer Dick Baldwin took the initiative to prepare a comprehensive, unified plan for ham spectrum. By working with the ARRL staff, they presented an overall proposal at an ITU conference in 1979. And the result was that hams gained use of three new radio bands at 10, 18, and 24 megahertz. Meanwhile, back in the USA, ARRL worked with the FCC and began its volunteer examiner program in 1984. Now hams themselves would be responsible for testing other hams for FCC licenses, developing a trust relationship enduring for over 30 years. ARRL also worked to get the FCC's Memorandum Opinion and Order, PRB1, that requires reasonable accommodation of hams in antenna zoning. And with the development of more CC&R private land use restrictions, the ARRL is looking at ways to find relief from them as well. And amateurs created a whole network of FM repeaters, allowing even the weak signals of small pocket-sized radios to reach out over large areas. There's no question but that amateur radio as we know it today would not exist were it not for past and present generations of ARRL members. Their actions, advancing and promoting not just themselves, but all of amateur radio, has made the difference. The ARRL created and maintains the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, a program of public service communications volunteers and provides training and liaison with other organizations that use our services in disasters. The ARRL hosts many contests throughout the year for polishing our operating skills and just having fun with radio. The ARRL hosts operating and special events including field day and the simulated emergency tests. The ARRL provides awards promoting operating excellence measured by how many places you may have contacted and also in the skills you use to make those contacts. For decades, the ARRL has been the organization hams can go to asking for the latest technical information and help. When there's a question about the FCC regulations or other legal matter involving amateur radio, ARRL is the place to get the correct information. We may not always like the answers, but they will be correct. ARRL members lead the way in promoting and advancing the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. This became even more evident with the computer explosion of the 1990s. Hams had already been exploring microprocessors for years, 
And far from seeing computers as a threat, Hams embraced them, incorporated them into the hobby, and the ARL empowered them by again making the information available to all. When I read articles in QST or in the ARRL's books, I can understand them. There are articles and books from antenna building to weather spotting. The writing is hams helping other hams, and I think, hey, I can do that. With ARRL's publications, references, and introductions, radio amateurs are empowered and exploring microwaves, satellite communications, Wi-Fi options, and mesh networks, building stations for themselves from huge contest facilities to the smallest backpack radios, even to putting them into tuna fish cans. Today's hams are already working on the systems for tomorrow, such as software-defined radios, or SDRs, where the radio is a computer. Want a new radio? You'll just be able to download it. Advancing the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio for all hams involves education. And no amateur organization does more in education than the ARRL. Not only do we publish books and materials on ham radio topics, ARRL and the ARRL Foundation provide scholarships, professional development training, support, and even radio equipment to schools. We even provide telecommunications training to leaders and rising stars from developing countries and teach them about amateur radio. We train engineers and others in finding and correcting interference problems. And we go to maker fairs to show amateur radio options to up and coming inventors. But there are challenges too. In 1996, some of the frequencies used by hams were threatened to be taken over by little LEOs, low earth orbiting satellites for commercial use. Then in 2004 came another commercial scheme called broadband over power lines or BPL, which would flood the spectrum with interference. Once again, it was the ARRL members leading the fight to protect all of amateur radio. Using hard facts to oppose wishful thinking, the ARRL fought politics with physics. The commercial threats to our amateur radio frequencies continue as more and more wireless devices want bandwidth. These commercial companies have money and power. Hams have the ARRL. When Katrina came in 2005, the ARRL members responded and over 1,000 hams came to help in reestablishing communications. The abilities of amateur radio's people in such devastation was noted by the government. Amateur radio has grown to the largest number of hams in U.S. history. Even with the development of a cellular phone world, the fun, hobby, technical skills, and emergency options provided by amateur radio are growing dramatically. But these new hams are just as rooted in computers as in radio. So they've developed hybrid systems employing the abilities of both. Today's hams are fluent with systems like D-Star, IRLP, Echolink, and APRS, all systems that use integrated digital radio and computer technologies. And they are constantly finding and creating new applications, along with apps for smartphones and other wireless devices. Where do we go from here? Our mission is to promote and advance the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. How we do it is up to you. By being an ARRL member, you not only reflect the commitment and enthusiasm of American hams, but also provide leadership as the voice of amateur radio in the USA, whether in dealings with the Federal Communications Commission, the International Telecommunication Union, the International Amateur Radio Union, or with the general public. The ARRL is all of us working together. For 100 years, ARRL members have been there to defend our spectrum, to help teach new hams, to encourage your enjoyment with contests and activities, to promote amateur radio in the media, to advocate for hams in Washington and in international conventions, to share the joy of creating new things, learning new things and realizing, hey, I can do that, and to do all that we can to help you enjoy our great hobby. And we're just getting started.
I am the A-R-R-L. 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 Y yo soy la K-E-L-A-R-L-L. I am the A-R-R-L. Hello. Hello. Okay. Sorry about that. Didn't want you to hear me breathing while all that was going on. All right. A lot of computers and stuff are merging with amateur radio. Uh, we've been sending email to HF and, excuse me, RF for years. Uh, over the recent years, it's... Uh, we can do any RF. Before that, they were doing it in the past, but they were using different words for it. So yes, we can send messages and messages and messages. Uh, we have programs that are on our phones for APRS, Automatic Packet Reporting System. Uh, on, on there, was there any, she used abbreviations. Is there any abbreviation somebody needs me to explain? Like EME. What's that? How many people in here are amateur radio operators? Okay. EME is Earth, Moon, Earth. So yes, we're bouncing signals off the moon. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's co contest just to do that, to bounce and see how many contacts you can get. Field day is a emergency. It was talking about starting field day. Field day, you go out into the field, you set up your equipment and see how many contacts you can get. It's also the uh, PR day or to get out in the community and show the community what amateur radio will do. Uh, recent years, Joe Taylor, who is a Nobel Prize laureate, released a program called uh, WSJTX and come out with FT8, FT4, and programs like that. So basically, you set your computer up, hit the button, and transmit, and everybody else starts responding to you. And you just hit the button and make a contact that way. So you don't even have to talk. There's loads and loads. How many people in here are radio operators? I didn't say ham radio operators. I said radio operators. <laughs> this is no license required. How many have a cell phone? Hopefully everybody in the room has got a cell phone. How many radios are in your cell phone? Five. Modern cell phones have five. Even the flip phones have four. Uh, Bluetooth, that was created by hams. How many people, when you're watching television, change the channels with a remote. Everybody. 
lady there in the back can probably remember when she told told her son to go change the tele television because she didn't have the remote. He was the television remote. And so, yes, all how many people have microwaves in their house? Microwave ovens. Uh, amateur radio is the reason for it. Everybody that's released stuff like that were amateurs. Okay. Oh, okay, how much more time do I need to kill? About 20 minutes? <laughs> like I said, I was a fill in and uh, I wasn't told that, hey, you're, you're on the schedule. And they come in there, you got nine minutes to set up. Crap. <laughs> Well, no, at least you told me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'd rather, I'm glad that you told me, hey, you're up. What? <laughs> uh, and we, we are having a special event station here at the conference. If you go outside and look, there is an antenna on the building out here. And I've got some hams back there supposedly trying to make contacts. So if you have a ham radio license, don't make two-meter contacts, simplex with you as well. So that covers that. What else can I cover? Things, as everything in this world goes, they, they talked about Katrina. They never did speak about 9-11. 9-11 within an hour, there was four hams set up and doing communications for fire and rescue. And of course, the media was listening to their transmissions because everything in amateur radio cannot be encrypted. Amateur radio is the first open source. It's been open source since the 1800s because hey we want people to talk to so well we're doing this so we teach other people how to do this and then we have somebody to talk to so yeah amateur radio was the first open source the qst is good there's other publications there's youtube i mean amateur radio youtubers are fantastic they go over a lot of things that, you know, 20 years ago we didn't have YouTube. But now we got people on YouTube that just do amateur radio. We have Parks on the Air. How many people know what Parks on the Air is? 2016, uh, the ARRL developed National Parks on the Air. It was such a success that some other people sit, went to the ARRL and said, hey, won't you continue with this? Says, we don't have the manpower to continue this. And so uh, Jason Johnson says, well, if you're not going to do it, I'm not. I'll do it. So he created Parks on the Air. They went out and got all the parks. It started out in the U.S. The U.S parks, state and national parks. They've got them. If you go to POTA.app, you can bring up all the parks. What do you do in POTA? You go out into the field, you set up your equipment, and you have to make 10 contacts for an activation. If you do more than 10 contacts, so be it. But you got to have those 10 contacts. There's other programs like SODA. Summit's on the air. So yes, we have people who take radios. Most of the time, it's the little ones like they were showing in the tuna can. They're still doing Morse code. Most of them are doing Morse code because not only they got to take the transmitter and the key, but they got to take a battery and an antenna. And so they want both of those to be light as possible because they're carrying it. Uh, lithium ion, what's the full name? Lithium ion, 
Okay, iron phosphate batteries. If you have ever had to lift a marine battery, there's now batteries that, that does the same thing. A marine battery is good 45 to 55 pounds. The one with the uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries weighs five pounds. And that is 100 watt hours. I can run my radio for all day at 100 watts at that value. So, yes, I'm up here doing the soft shoe. Uh, is there any questions? I'm also doing the ham cram tonight for anybody who wants to get their license. We will be testing for licenses tomorrow night at 7. Hopefully the people coming for the ham cram have been studying. And my main thing in the ham cram is to cover questions that people have. Are there, are there any questions that I can answer now? What is a Yagi? A Yagi is a type of antenna. It's a beam antenna. It focuses the radiation or the signal from the antenna to a very narrow point. Yes, sir. Sure. And we've had some people go down to Y cars to look at their open house on Wednesday night. Uh, I think there was probably two. I don't know if it was, okay. Yeah, I knew some hams that went down there. Yes, sir. All righty. Their amateur radio three is a important number. There's three different licenses, tech, general, and extra. To get started, uh, hamstudy.org. I recommend everybody download the, uh, go get the ARRL ham amateur radio manual and read it. hamstudy.org, aa9pw.com com for online practice test, ARL.org for practice test. We have had five-year-olds pass the technician test. I've got a, when she was nine years old, she passed her tech Nine and a half, she passed her general. Ten, she passed her extra. And she is a monster on CW or Morse code. She does 30 words per minute on CW. At, and now she's 11 years old. I have been doing testing at self since self Four, the fourth self. Why does why are we allowed to be here? Amateur radio was the first open source. At that session, I had three candidates. This was at the Blake Hotel in downtown Charlotte, and it was a seven-year-old walked in. Her and her dad just happened to come to the convention and seen that it was testing. It was an ARL exam. She was going the next week with her girlfriend to go test. So she tested and she passed. So she come up and I said, sweetheart, I got some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? I said, she said the bad news. The pa bad news is you pass. So this week you get to cram on your general so when you go test with your girlfriend next weekend, you're going to be taking your general exam. 
She didn't think she passed, but she passed. When you take your exams, a technician can miss nine questions. A general can miss nine questions out of 35. The extra is a 50 question exam. You can miss 13. So, so you have to have a 37 or better to pass. Yes, sir. No, 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 no. That was up to her daddy. Her daddy brought her. Yes, get your kids in the ham radio because they will not have money to get into drugs and everything else. <laughs> you know. Or you won't have any money because they're going to be spending it on your money to get all the equipment. Especially the, the price of amateur radio since... Uh, if everybody doesn't know, the audio chips, the, the chips that go in amateur radios are used for almost everything. There are thousands of automobiles sitting in lots because they're missing the chips. The chips shortage is easing up, but it's going to be years before it's over with. And right now, the price of amateur radios are sky high, especially the HF radios. Uh, I've got an ICOM 7300, which is S it's a SDR, so it's a software-defined radio. I bought mine new at $900. They're selling them today for $1,300. Sometimes you can find a coupon and you can get it for 1100 or somewhere in there, but still, that's, that's a heck of an increase. How, how much does it start, how much does it cost to get into amateur radio? You can go on Amazon and download a Bofang UV5R Plus for less than $30. A lot of people are against the Bofangs. They're cheap. I've got Bofangs and Bofangs and Bofangs. And I've got a Yesu FT60. Well, when I bought the uh, Yesu FT60, it was 160 bucks. Well, now it's about $400 for that same radio. And they are not making them anymore. Yes, sir. They're still doing that. Okay. Huh? Uh, anybody that gets their license in the next couple months, go register at QR. Uh, shoot. Yeah, but they ain't going to have that. And they won't, they automatically get a. Uh, if they go to QRZ.com, you can register with uh, Gigaparts to get a, an Explorer 1 radio for free. Right. QRZ.com, and it's through Gigaparts, and you get sent, and we'll fill it out. They'll ask you when you what your call sign, when you got license, and uh, they'll send you a VHF, UHF walkie-talkie. Excuse me handheld transmitter. Walkie-talkie is a, believe it or not, a copyright thing. Yes. It's copyrighted by Motorola. Yes, it's copyrighted by Motorola. So what do you call it now? Uh, handheld transmitter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. CB radio is another. No, sir. No license required. That's what happened to it. They dropped the license, and a lot of shenanigans started happening on the bands, 
and people like me, I was going down the road and had a, actually I was going to a Linux conference in Ohio. I had my dear old son in the car and I had a CB in the car. The language and the fanity that was happening on the CB, I reached over, turned it off. When I got back, I took the CB out of the car and that was it. So even the truckers now are going away from CB. They're actually going for the GMRS, which is another service. General, General Mobile Radio Service. But the problem with CB is usually distance. Okay? Sometimes on CB, you can get long ways because CB is using 27 megahertz. So if you're little, when you were little, most of the handhelds were 27 megahertz. You were lucky if they went a quarter mile. Well, uh, the most I can get nowadays with a CB is maybe five miles. So where I can take a Bofang radio at five watts, hit a repeater, and I can talk to some everybody in a 100-mile range. GMRS is still line of sight. You will go to Walmart or any big retailer, and you will see GMRS, FRS radios. The difference between using GMRS and FRS is the power rating. If you want to use the highest power rating, you have to get a license, and it costs $35. There's no test required. But it's still line of sight. And it, on the packaging, a lot of them will say 36-mile range. Yes, it's 36-mile range if you got somebody down here at sea level, and this person over here at 36 miles away is 2,000 feet up, and they, got, they can see each other. It's line of sight. VHF and UHF are line of sight. Otherwise, the signal just keeps going out into space. These other bands like HF, we bounce off the atmosphere. Okay? They're going to change from AM to FM, which is actually more in line with what they've been doing in Europe for the last 10 years. It's going to take up the same bandwidth, but it's supposed to give a better quality signal. So what, what do you say that? Changing the CB. And besides the good old boys uh, down here, it's probably not going to affect that many people anymore. Because like I said, most people, if they're a family person, don't want their kids hearing that mess. But last time I was on CB, it's getting better. <coughs> Excuse me. Have you said a good, good source to download for studying? Hamstudy.org. And we offer free testing. We're, we are a Laurel Amateur Radio Club. We use that VEC, and so they have free testing. We do not charge to test. And actually, at this event, everybody takes, the first 20 people will take their test using a tablet. If we get more than 25, 20 people, at that point, they get the written test. I've got my box in the car, and so I can handle up to 50 people. I have tested 50 people at one time at this location in the past. So uh, that's another reason I got away from the ARL, because I got tired of handling their money. You know, 50 times 15 is a lot of money. So 
or is there any other questions about ham radio or anything else? Hamstudy.org, aa9pw.com, arrl.org. All have online testing, practice test. Oh, what has changed? You can even take your amateur radio license exam online in your home. You have to have a webcam. You have to have a good internet. Uh, the Greater Los Angeles Amateur Radio Group, I can't remember the last letter, GLARG, yeah, group. So that's right. During COVID, they started, basically started online testing. Uh, they charge you, if you, $10 to test, each attempt, but if you, if you pass technician, you can take, you can try general for the same $10. ARL charges 15, you pay for the seat. As long as you're passing, you, you, you keep your seat. Once you fail, it costs you another amount of money to try again. So, uh, GLARG is doing online testing. You can sign up for a GLARG, te a GLARG session through hamstudy.org. I'm also at GLARGVE, as well as an ARL and a LARC, and a W5YIVE as well. There are 13 VECs rec recognized, 14, excuse me, VECs recognized by the FCC to give amateur radio exams. Uh, one reason I switch, another reason I switched from ARL when I turn in the reports for Royal Amateur Radio Club, so tomorrow night we'll s send in the information. Monday morning, people have their upgrades and their license. Well, you won't have your licenses because you got to pay the FCC a $35 fee now. But as soon as you pay the fee, it's usually the next day you have your call sign. Mm-hmm. Dot com. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. sir. I guess kind of a beginner question. So you said that the whiskey boiling at Ben Field was, was uh, trying to establish contact. Right. Is that is that being done on a particular band, a particular frequency? Is there a procedure for doing that? Uh, right now, we are using three different bands. Uh, the 80 meter band, which is 3.7 megahertz. The 40 meter band, which is 7 megahertz. And the 20 meter band, which is 14 megahertz. Also, we got remote ham radio. So one of our members is using the internet and controlling a Superstation down in Atlanta. And he's already made 80, we, when, we, when you apply for a special event station like Whiskey for Lima or Whiskey for Lennox is what we call it, you get it, you get it for two weeks. So it started on Friday, the 3rd. And so he actually got on uh, remotely remote ham operation, and uh, he has 87 contacts already before we even got the session, everything set up here. So yesterday I spent time getting, basically my day was getting the antenna on the roof, get every, and Mr. Ken right here was instrumental in getting this set up, and we appreciate you. And so, yeah, we got it up. It stayed up overnight. It's still up when I, before I walked in here. So. And I went back, and they was getting the station set up. So anybody that's a ham radio operator, if you want to operate, we can operate with you. Tomorrow, I will be setting up a VHF, UHF station, unless they, don't, unless they get it set up. 
Now, I got teenage boys back there. I, I'd rather for them to do the work to me, but, you know, I brought everything to make sure we had it. So. <laughs> I went back there and got my stuff set up and, told, and said, put it up. What if we do something wrong? Well, correct it and go again. It's not that hard. Hot dog, that means I got, uh, I'm down to one minute, one or two minutes. Are there any other questions? Uh, I've been here every self. The first one is in Clemson University. Uh, then we had two in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and it's been here. Well, then we had two at the Blake, and then we've been here ever since. So any, you can find me here every year. And right now, me and my, my wife and me have been stuck in regis registration all day. But tomorrow, I'm going to operate the radio station. So are there any questions? I appreciate everybody that it, came to the talk. I'm sorry that it was a off-the-cuff thing, but that's a fill-in talk. I'm here, and I'm doing it. Thank you, everybody. I'm done, Zach. A friend of mine. Actually, we tested him, and he got his deceased grandfather's.